What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Bronx Pinstripe Show. The Yankees took two out of three from Arizona, completing a six and one road trip, which is, I think, better than any of us anticipated. You think going into when that you go road against trip. the Arizona Diamondbacks, who uh, you know who just won their World Series team, right? Yeah. You play Houston Astros. Sure. Tough, tough Best start team to the in the season. American League, arguably. The, to start the season, you go six one, and and not to mention two series wins, which is the most important thing. Win those series and move on. You're going to have a really good, uh, really good record at the end of the uh, at the end of the day and at the end of the season. So yeah, you know what Only I was one thinking, game was flat. What I was thinking yesterday is that um, I mean the Yankees nearly had to start their season against the both the World Series teams from the previous year. I know the Astros didn't make the World Series, but they went to Game 7 of, of the ALCS. So they very easily could have been in the World Series against the Diamondbacks. And that would have been the first time in history and the only time in history that a team the next season has to play the NL and AL reigning champs from the previous year because now with the balanced schedule, you can start the season with a, with an interleague game. Because yeah. it used to be interleague. You didn't start that until later in the season, so you could never have your first two series against... So the Yankees very nearly had their first two series against the, the the champs from both leagues in the previous year. So yeah, it was a it was a very difficult road trip, and they went six and one. Like you said, only one flat game. Does this road trip at, change your opinion of this team at all? Um, no, it's too small of a size. I'm excited for it. I, you know, it's fun to watch. I'm glad they're doing well. Volpe's obviously starting off the season insanely hot. Um, so and they, they did this really all without judge judge you know came yeah, alive finally yesterday. got the home run yesterday and in the, the double. double so he he finally uh he came alive but um yeah so th here's the thing like when i what makes me feel really good about looking back and seeing what happened here is that there's another player at least one other player that is there to take the load if judge is off and i think that's a big deal because last year the yankees went as far as aaron judge went and when Aaron Judge didn't go, the Yankees didn't go. Yeah. Now they have another bona fide superstar in Juan Soto. And, you know, he had a couple games of a, of a tough stretch here and, and Judge picked it up. So you have this you have this um, this a little bit of a fail safe and a little bit of a of a, uh, you know, a, a catch all. If one of these guys is off, not to mention, you know, that helps everybody else around them. So I feel I good in that way. I like I like the way that that things are moving um, and I'm very very excited about Volpe first and foremost. I think the intangible things from this road trip have me ex extra excited and maybe have changed my opinion a bit because even though on paper they, they got Juan Soto and they upgraded their outfield with Verdugo and all of that stuff, there was still probably some doubt in a lot of people's minds. I know there was doubt in my mind. It's like, how would this team respond to adversity? Because they have not been a team that has responded well to adversity pretty much under Aaron Boone but really the last couple of years and they came back in all of the games or then uh, once they blew the lead, the last game in Houston, were able to come back and win that game. And then yesterday afternoon in Arizona, after taking the lead in extra innings and blowing it and then coming back again, like that is that this team showed the ability to overcome adversity on this road trip. So for yeah. that has changed my opinion a bit. I know it's a small sample size, but they've, they've now shown it in, a seven game sample, like multiple times that they can do that from the offensive side. I also think for me, they got contributions outside of judge and Soto because mm -hmm. all spring training, you and me were talking about how this offense, if it's just judge and Soto, it's still not going to be good enough to, to be a playoff caliber offense. You can't just rely on two guys, even if they are two of the best guys in the sport, you need contributions from other places. And we saw Volpe have an awesome road trip. We saw Cabrera have some huge moments. Verdugo for a, as times he struggled, he also had some big hits and some big moments on this road trip. He got uh, a couple sack flies in Houston to give mm -hmm. the Yankees some key runs. And he got the two run home run in Arizona. And then, so they, they got, contributions from other places in the lineup outside of judge and Soto, which is great. The pitching side though, I think has been completely as expected where the rotation hasn't been able to go deep in games. We have some numbers there and the bullpen has been effective, but already has a been little lucky. They've, a there's ton. A, they've worked a ton. They've been a little lucky. They've definitely, yeah. you know, when you look at the hits per, per inning, it's, it's uh, I think we, we looked it up. It was eighth in, um, 
eighth in baseball, eighth most in baseball hits per well, inning. So you, when you pitched s- also a ton of innings, when you pitch a lot of innings, you're going to give up a lot of hits. Yeah, but there there's definitely base runners that are that are happening there. So, yep. um, and again, like that's we talked about this for a long time. I think the pitching staff is the definitely the, the place to be to be keeping a, a closer eye on. And obviously, you know, first week of the season, you're not going to stretch the guys especially the Yankees are not going to stretch the pitchers, you know, into uh, the the seventh inning, if you even need to sixth and seventh inning, but there there's been, there's been a reason why they've also been pulled out. It hasn't really just been pitch count. It's been a reason that, uh, you know, they're pulled out in the, in the fifth inning um, specifically Rodon, man. Like when I'm looking at Rodon and, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm looking for that number two guy. And, and I know a lot of people are, are looking around and I'm just like, taking taking the pulse of what the what the narrative is uh on social from from him people are like oh you know this is the guy we want he's got that life on the fastball he's got the he's still jamming up the base paths with with runners uh whether it's whether they're getting hits or he's still walking guys so he's playing with fire there's no doubt he's playing with fire the yankees haven't really given up many home runs either on the season so they haven't been beaten by that big long ball they've been he gave uh, up a know, couple they've yes, they've sir. given but not not when you look at the season, there there haven't yeah. been a ton. So they're getting beat by base hits. They're getting beat by you know giving up, move, base getting on, moving them over, base hits, doubles in the gap, things like that. So, um, well, really, the only clean start was Stroman's uh, of yeah. the first uh, seven games. Like his his was very clean, and Schmidt's up into up until the point when he he got pushed into the sixth inning. Schmidt uh, was probably the most because Stroman. There were even errors behind him. So yeah. I mean, when you're looking at what. The, the team, it wasn't a clean team start, but yeah, Stroman looked good. Yeah. With, with, um, with Rodon, it's, I, do you remember the feeling that you had watching Kyle Farnsworth pitch? <laughs> Is that what we're comparing Rodon to? I mean, as far as, like, obviously makeup... one's a, re- one's a reliever, one's a, one's a, a starter, but when Kyle Farnsworth was in the game, you would look at the radar gun and it would say like 98 miles an hour. And you're like, no one's going to touch this guy. And then he, he would drop like an 89 mile And that was 98 when 98 Back when 98, went back when relievers were throwing 94 and Kyle Farnsworth was throwing 98, not when everyone was throwing 98, right. And then he would drop like an 88 mile an hour slider, knee buckling slider on. You'd be like, oh, th- this is fine. But then he would four pitch walk a guy and then he would hit a batter and then he would throw a wild pitch. And you're like, oh, right. I don't trust this guy at all. That's kind of the feeling I have when Rodon is out there. Like the stuff... I get it. The stuff you want a different comp that's going to piss you off and drive people nuts that remember uh, watching this man pitch on a day to day basis. Michael Pineda. Oh, huh. yeah. Yeah. Michael Pineda, my, you know, body language was different, but prevalent. Um, obviously, we, you know, we used to joke all the time about him being the, the car wash air arm guy because he would always just like act like it was the biggest shock in the world when something when something happened or if anybody barreled up his uh, a fastball. Both but very that's a, sweaty men, too. Very sweaty men. By the way, Nike, fix it, please. Can we <laughs> fix these uniforms? This is this is crazy that they're walking into the season. Like you can see underwear, you can see all the sweat marks, you can see the the two toned color grays. The, it's it's crazy that the fact that they had all this time to product, and it's this is Nike. Nike, we're talking about, who is is uh, you know renowned for their product testing. No, no product testing here. Apparently, no no giving. You know, you can't get like. Uh, you can't get one of the sweatiest men in baseball to come to your to your facility for a couple of days. Heat them up, get them throwing, the and see what happens. Baseball. Who do we think is the sweatiest man in baseball? Uh, hot dog, uh, old hot dog breath. <laughs> Lance Lynn. Lance Lynn. <laughs> get yeah, Lance well, Lynn. Well, they're, is, they're what, is he even like, pitching? Is he? Is he? He's in St. The, Louis, I think. Right. The, um, the, he's the, not far. The product engineers at Nike are probably like, oh, baseball is not a sport where you sweat a lot. You don't yeah. move around much. And then, they reali- then they realize, oh, wait a second. This sport is primarily played in 97 degree humidity. This is a George Costanza special is what's happening here. This is like, also th- April still. Imagine, like I said, when it's July and August at Yankee Stadium and it's it's oppressively hot. Yeah. So they're, this is they're going to be wearing body suits and they're going to be like all different color uniforms the, the, the yes, yes is yes is gonna have to put the pixels around around their groin so we don't just see everything <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> yeah it's um it's wild what were we just talking about we were talking about something you were oh, comparing pineda. rodon to um michael pineda and just the uneasiness when, when he's the on the uneasiness mound. but also you you get excited for the stuff pineda had yes. more pitches but you get excited <laughs> for right. stuff. Yeah, he had multiple pitches um and 
And then you're, you're watching it and you're like, you get fired up because there's, you know, he, he'll, 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 he'll throw a 98 mile an hour fastball past a guy with some movement. And you're like, yes, that's it. And then he'll walk two guys or he'll give up, you know, base hits because he's grooving fastballs over the plate. It's just, you know, that, that type of guy can be very frustrating. And I, and I, I think that's what we're, I think that's what we have. We're going to see moments of dominance and then moments of like, what in God's name is happening right here. This should not be happening to a guy like uh, a guy like you, who, who we need as our number two, who is paid an that's exorbitant right. amount of money. Exactly. He's, he's being paid as a number one, really, but he's, he's the Yankees number two. He's being relied on to be their number two and would love it if right now with Garrett Cole injured him to be the number one guy. If he was just there to be a depth rotation piece, you could live with this, but the expectations are for him to be a force in that rotation and a consistent, a consistent force. And be able to go deep into games and he hasn't been able to do that. And we're going to talk about his, his pitch mix breakdown in a second, but first the Yankees are home for their first home stand of the season. If you are looking for tickets, you should use game time. Game time is now an authorized ticket marketplace of major league baseball, meaning buying tickets to baseball games on game time is now faster and easier than ever. Opening day is going to cost you some cash just as every single opening day is. But if you're just looking to go to a game this weekend, there's so many good seats available for Saturday and Sunday's game on game time. My pick for good and affordable seats would be on Saturday, section 418, which is definitely up there. It's upper deck just to the right of uh, home plate if you're looking out towards the field. But the tickets can be yours with an all-in pricing of just $58 per ticket. And I think that's really good value for opening weekend. The Game Time app has so many cool features to use. Flash deals, you can see what sections the best deals are in. You can also, if you're trying to buy last minute tickets, you can set some uh, alerts so that they will tell you when ticket prices are dropping. You can go in and swoop them up. The all-in pricing, like I mentioned, so you're not hit with any surprise fees at checkout. And then also seat view, so you can get real pictures from inside the venue, so you can make sure you are getting what you want. Game Time is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets to sporting events, but you can also find tickets for concerts, comedy shows, theaters, theater events, and much more. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and same row for less money somewhere else, game time will credit you 100%, 110% of the difference. So you can actually make some money back. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, use code Bronx for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Once again, create an account, redeem code B-R-O-N-X for 20 bucks off. That's code Bronx. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Rodon. His pitch breakdown on Wednesday in Arizona was 62% fastball, 18% slider, 10.5% cutter, 5% changeup, and uh, did he curveball? He threw a curveball? 4% 4 curveball? I guess he throws a curveball. Uh, whatever. Uh, where are these from? Are these from uh, StackCast or are they from Brooks Baseball? These are StackCast. StackCast. So that's stack not a changeup. It's a, cur that's a curveball? He does throw both. Um, he didn't throw a curveball. Um, he didn't throw... A change up in his first start, but in his second start, he did break. Uh, yeah, he threw one curveball in his threw, first start. Yeah, he threw a few. He uses his curveballs kind of like a get me over breaking ball because he can't throw his slider for a strike. That's kind of the way that I understand it. Yikes. <laughs> no, it, it, it's just do they do they have a do they have an acronym for EFIS? Because maybe uh, maybe El Duque needs to come in and teach him how to throw an EFIS pitch. That'll shock some people. Yeah, R Rodon strikes me as the guy that would you know you remember the pitchers that would struggle to be able to just lob it over to first base. Yeah, um, he, yeah. I don't know. I don't. I can't recall if, I, when the last time he had to throw to a base is, but he strikes me as a guy that would struggle to throw to a base. Well, you know what's going to happen is that once he finishes delivery, his his uh, his jersey is going to stick to his arm and shoulder so that when he does field the ball and try to throw it over, it's going to be like a, it's going to be like, you know, rookie of the year. It's going to be a nice it's going to be it's going to restrict movement. It's going to be tight uh, and, and it's going to be drilled into the ground. So have you also noticed Rizzo's he's scooping in, in the first week? It's not going to get caught. Have you noticed Rodon is in an awful fielding position when he finishes his delivery? I can say that I have not noticed that, but look at but it. I'm sure it, his, it doesn't it, surprise me. Essentially, his back is facing the hitter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now I can picture it because he does. He falls he does off to the third base body. side. Falls yeah. off to the third base side, and it's not like his back is fully facing. But, but if you're watching on YouTube right now, he kind of finishes where it's like this, where his shoulder is yeah. like pointed towards the the third base. He's side. got a lot of it's it's his his uh, his mechanics take him across his body. Yes, so. across his body, and like anything up the middle, he's got no chance. 
Um, so I, I don't I want saw him fielding anything up the middle anyway. <laughs> I saw some comment. I saw a comment that like we have too much hate for Rodon from from the last episode because oh yeah, we spent of the hour long episode 55 minutes just talking positively about the sweep in Houston. And we spent five minutes bitching about Rodon. And, uh, and now here we are. <laughs> it's like the first 15 minutes that uh, five minutes have been spent on Rodon, but it, it goes back to the expectations and what this team needs right now. Like my bold prediction of, of Nestor Cortez ain't looking so hot after his first two starts of the season. Um, but Nestor's hey, that, the kind that's of guy why that it was called in, a bold man. prediction. And you're right. Yeah. He, he'll, he'll hopefully settle in. We all want Rodon to be a more consistent piece in that rotation, especially while Cole is out. And I just don't see it happening with his makeup, his his arsenal, his ability to consistently throw quality strikes, his consistent consistency to go deep into games at a lower than you know a lower than average pitch count. Like all of these things are are working. He's the opposite of. They're all working against him, and that's just really tough for someone you're paying 28 million bucks to over six years. These are all known quantities though. It's not like he hasn't shown this, this type of, uh, this type of game throughout his career. Cause he has, and he has found consistent moments within his career too. So uh, look, I, again, he, he hasn't done anything terrible this year. Like he's been okay. I think he's been okay at, at this point. Um, but as the season goes on, you know, obviously within even the, the, the third, fourth, fifth starts, definitely looking for him to stretch, get it, get, he needs to get into the sixth and seventh inning like that guy at that at that point in the rotation certainly needs to do it because the long tail effect and that's what we have to look at when we're when we're looking at how this team operates it's not just it's there is such an effect that if, if something happens with the number two starter and the number two starter doesn't get out of the fifth inning and then the ro- and then the bullpen has to come in that's going to put pressure on the bullpen and the starting pitchers for the rest of the rotation until that guy's spot comes around and oh, by the way, Garrett Cole's not there to sell, to, to 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 fill in for that number one that you know damn well. You're right. Getting, Every you're fifth day, seven, he's going eight. seven innings. Yeah. Yeah. You don't. You don't. This have rotation that. So, does not have that right now. The first and first that's why seven it's important games for Rodon to 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 find the you know the can the he be that though, or do they have to find it somewhere else? I don't know if he can be that. He needs. He certainly can be that. He certainly has the ability to be that guy. He can get deep into games. He can throw innings. So what was? Can, can you guys look at? In San Francisco, what is average pit, like? How many starts did he make, and how many innings did he pitch? And just get like a rough average of uh, innings pitch per start. But first, uh, first seven games, Nestor Cortez two starts, ten innings pitched. So he he each time pitched five innings. I know he pitched into the sixth inning um, on Tuesday in the game the Yankees got blown out in. But it's five innings a start. Rodon nine and two thirds innings, so under five innings per start for him. Mm-hmm. Stroman went the longest six innings in his one start, and he's going to start the home opener if that even happens because of the awful weather right now coming through the New York area. Clark Schmidt five and a third. Luis Heel four and two thirds. Uh, also pulled before he could get the win. We have some stuff in here on Heel. Like he, oh, we're going to talk you, about Heel because if you compare compared. though, like the, we're going to talk glowingly about Luis Heel's stuff. Okay, and you're gonna be like, "Hey, you you guys are frauds." You're talking glowingly about Luis Hill stuff, and then on the flip side, shitting all over Rodon. How much money does Luis Hill make? Why is he even in this rotation right now? And what are the expectations of him? And then ask those same questions about Carlos Rodon. Yeah, and what was he doing last year? Answer <laughs> Recovering that from surgery, Tommy John surgery. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, oh, he averaged. Uh, so Ilya just put this in here in San Francisco. He averaged five and two thirds. Okay, so right now that's he's averaging getting. four that's and two thirds, getting. though. And you know what? It's it's funny because that's the reason I think when you see uh, one of the reasons why Blake Snell didn't get yeah didn't get signed is 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 this they're not going he's not going deep into games he's giving up base runners like yes it worked out for him and he's got a track record of it working out but it's not you can't value it as 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 high uh, at least some teams are not valuing valuing it as high. Uh, in in this year's it goes market. back to the question. I remember asking you this question. And I forget what you answered. Would you rather your pitcher go five innings and give up one run, or go six innings and give up three runs, or go seven innings and give up? You know what I'm saying? Remember that? Remember we we're talking about like how much value is that extra inning or extra four outs, even if it means another run? Sometimes that value can be worth it, especially to save a bullpen because this bullpen through the first seven games, which there were no off days in the first seven games. That's, That's also very yeah. unusual to start a season. Usually you, sure. you play a game 
then the next day is an off day or you've got an off day sprinkled in there so- somewhere or you get a rain out because it's crappy weather, but they played on uh, in domes the first seven games. So the bullpen so far, Hamilton's thrown five and two thirds. Loisic has thrown four innings. Dude, Holmes, Hamilton's looked absolutely he has. He really, he, he, he is the real deal. You know, that's a, the sh- another the Schlambino, just an absolute gem that they, that they found with him. And he's just, uh, I love his attitude and he's just got that, that blue collar, uh, that blue collar feel. He fits beautifully here. Holmes four and a third, Ferguson three innings, Birdie two and two, uh, two and a third, Gonzalez two and a third, and Weaver three and two thirds. It's a lot of innings through two series for these bullpen guys. Yeah, but again, like you said, no days off. There's a long stretch, and they're they're not pushing the starters uh, at all into into games because of where where we are in the season. So look, jury's out. I'm not I'm not crushing anything. These are just observations, I think, at this point, and, and identifying to see if we can pick up on any trends. Uh, and seeing where where guys are and and, you know you want to see you want to see growth at this point I think from start to start whether it's uh, length or you know identifying pitch mix that's working well for you things like that so it's a game throughout the season but hold on you you say they're not pushing guys who would they have been pushed Nestor Cortez has not no I'm saying just because of the season they're not pushing them uh, lengthwise as far as they tried to do that Stroman pitched six innings they tried to push Schmidt into the sixth inning he couldn't get through it, so they had to pull him. They're not going to push Hill, I think, because of him coming back from surgery and also him being who he is right now. You're not going to push Hill, so he's not in contention. Cortez has not pitched well enough to warrant being pushed, even though they tried to push him in a game they were losing, and he couldn't pit, get an out in the sixth inning. So really, the only other guy is Rodon. Which you would expect to get pushed. That's Why the guy you need to push. So next time, next time out there. In yeah, this... I think there's a. I think there's a. Whether they, again, I don't think, I don't think the outcome was as much to do with when they were going to get pulled anyway. So they're they're going to get they're being more conservative in the in the first week and and with the first couple starts. So again, jury's out. We'll see what happens the rest of April. Any other NFL quarterback cousins we can bring in? Does uh does Aaron Rodgers have, no does Patrick Patrick Mahomes okay we know he's come That's comes a from a baseball family, family. Let, let's get his cousin in here okay yeah not his brother but his cousin for sure <laughs> no one likes his brother right <laughs> doesn't everybody hate his brother there's a um there's yeah he's uh so cousins poor bastard walks in just gives up uh, gives up Classic. a bomb immediately can't throw in prime time cannot throw in prime time that guy. <laughs> Well, as you know, I work from home and I do not like wearing sweatpants because then I do not feel like a real adult with a job, but I need a comfortable pair of pants to wear at my desk all day. And for that, I highly recommend Dewar jeans. They are by far the most comfortable jeans I have ever owned. Dewar makes stretch performance denim and lifestyle apparel for men and women. Their timeless styles are unlike traditional denim because they are made from natural fibers for high stretch, breathability, and moisture absorption. It's the perfect mix of comfort, style, and stretch. I have a pair of the Performance Denim Heritage Wrench, which is a nice dark color. They fit and look great. It's perfect for work, work at home, or if you go to an office, running an errand, or going out for a nice dinner. Last episode, I asked you how often you wash your jeans. You said like every three or four wears, maybe. And I said I I sometimes go seven or more wears. Well, Dewar jeans have antimicrobial properties, which can help the pants go longer between washes. So if you're someone that does not like to wash your jeans often, Dewar jeans are the pair of jeans for you. Upgrade your wardrobe with a pair of Dewar jeans today. Use our link for 20% off shopdewar.com slash Bronx. That's spelled D-U-E-R. You can also check out their flagship stores in LA and Denver. Again, shopdewar.com slash Bronx for 20% off. Don't miss this amazing deal. Thank you very much, Dewar. Uh, the end of the game yesterday, so the Yankees obviously blew the lead after the Verdugo two-run bomb, which was a shot. Did you also see Boone's comment after the game about uh, about uh, Verdugo? He said, yeah, I wish he just stopped and looked at it a little more. So he he ribbed him a little more for pimping the home run, which I, I, I guess that's part of his game, man. Th- no, it's part of his game, but that that is as critical as Boone is going to be to a player where it's like he's saying it as a joke. But he's also saying, like, hey, dude, if you, if you get one in the ribs next time, that's why. So I, I did appreciate that from Boone. Um, but the, the way they blew the game was obviously uh, alarming with uh, poor defense because the, the wild throw from Volpe, we were talking about this before. 
he he looked at the runner at third base and then ended up having to rush the throw and it pulled uh, Rizzo wide off the bag. Rizzo sometimes makes that play no problem with the swoop tag on the runner, but it fell out of his glove and, and the guy was safe and the run scored. And then ultimately they had the dribbler over the mound that, that scored the, the, the tying run. But in that situation, uh, Volpe looking at the third, the runner at third base is not really that important because if, if he lets that run score and then gets the out at first base, then you've got a one run lead base is clear two outs. That's a much better position to be in to just secure a game than checking the runner and potentially making a wild throw, obviously, which happened and they ended up blowing the game. So that's just, I, there's been a couple of wild throws from, from Volpe so far, but that's like an awareness play that you just need to understand the game situation. Like that run scoring doesn't matter. Yeah, no, it doesn't matter. But at the same time, like you're as a as a fielder at that point, you're going to give a glance over. He just needs to execute. That's all. He needs to execute. I don't have any problem with him looking at the runner because if there is a significant play, it's an easy play. Then you know, use your instincts to do what you think is right. But um, he just needs to make that throw. And and frankly, like Rizzo normally makes that that tag and that catch and tag on on a throw like that. So I see this as uh, just a little bit of cobwebs, but. Um, yeah, for the most part, you don't want you want to talk about the other thing is the fact that the the runner on second base is dumb, and that if the How runner on second base, how can you say base, that after that game yesterday? The exciting the runner on second base was such an exciting reason, finish to the game. Well, th th that inning shouldn't have happened because the game would have been over with all the little dribblers that that were given up by by Holmes. I mean, the exit velocity, the guy's doing his job, you know, with uh, with ground balls in the infield, um, and. Unfortunately, there's a runner on second base standing there that 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 ends up scoring, which wouldn't have scored. Oh, the Yankees wouldn't have had two runs. They would have had one run, and they would have won the game. Maybe. Yeah. I just don't. I mean, you, we're, we disagree on this. You're never going to change my opinion. I'm never going to change your opinion. But like, objectively, that was an exciting finish to a game. If, right? Okay. If yes, objectively, it was a. When you look at the Yankees' offense, the fact that Aaron Judge was involved with it as well, fun excitement. Uh, on the hitting side, but yeah, it also, you know, the and so if you're major league baseball, a difference maker, if you're major league baseball and you're looking for more excitement in your long ass regular season yeah. and not have games, just, I know why end, they're doing it. And with solo home runs in extra innings in the 17th inning, this makes sense. And I understand it's not in the playoffs and I like that it's not in the playoffs, but for the regular season, it's fun. Anything else from uh, Wednesday's game that you want to touch on? No, I want to talk about Luis Heal and the uh, the level of excitement that everybody has. Actually, there's one more thing I want to talk about from, from Wednesday's game. Okay. Uh, thankfully, Scott McDo, McDo, McDoey, the pitcher, was up to finish that game. Okay? Boone said he was going to walk in a run, even if the, if the runner uh, reached base and, and get to the pitcher because the Yankees had a lead at that point. Um, but that, you know, if, if, if Arizona's not out of bench players – and it's not a pitcher up there, which also the the strike three call probably a ball. I mean, umpire blue was was off there for both sides. It wasn't one side. He was making some very suspect calls all all night long, all day long. Uh, so I don't know. I don't even know whose side may, had it worse. You know, both sides benefited. Both sides both sides felt the pain of of that man. So yeah. Um, all right. Yeah. So Luis Hill. His fastball uh, it was unhittable, literally. Uh, averaged 97.7 miles per hour and touched 100. 34.8% whiffs on his fastball, which on a fastball is pretty unheard of. And he did not allow a hit on the pitch. He threw 52 fastballs, 17 changeups, which averaged 91 miles an hour, and 15 sliders, which averaged 88 miles an hour. So all of his stuff is hard. Everything's 88 mile, miles an hour and above. The slider, though, compared to a lot of uh, compared 10 to miles a lot an of, hour, 10 mile an hour off. The difference is good, and like that's not that's not all that hard. Like there are guys that throw it a little harder, um, touch the low 90s. Like he's got some difference. He's got he's got a good, uh, you know, uh, deduct or miss plus minus on his fastball and, and breaking stuff, which is, which is awesome to see, especially with someone who has such an electric fastball, but he was pulled with two outs in the fifth inning at 84 pitches. So he could not get the win on Monday. Yeah. Um, and clearly he, 85 was the number that they were yeah. looking at and didn't want him to start another batter. He was frustrated. I don't think he was like frustrated necessarily with Boone or, or anything. I think he was frustrated with himself because he did walk three guys. He got into trouble in the third. He lost the strike zone a bit. Um, but one but of those strikeouts, I'm sorry. One of those walks was a strikeout that wasn't called for the record, but yeah, 
but his uh his stuff was electric enough where even when he put runners on base Arizona was really not able to touch him um so that start from heel should have fans very excited uh and, and I guess because if 85 was the number that's that's made sense to pull him and for someone like Hill, they're going to stick to that plan, even if it means an out before. It just like sucks when it's like one out away, um, yeah. because who knows? Maybe he gets a, a first pitch pop up on 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 his eighty fifth pitch, but you can't risk that when he could have a nine pitch at bat. Yeah, and whatever it's it's this early in the season. I still the confidence wise, I, I I'm more about like, hey, give him that last that last uh, that last out. See if he can get out of it. What, what does five pitches at the end of the day mean? Does it really mean anything? Does eight, eight more pitches mean anything? It doesn't like it does not. Well, um, I mean, we t- remember you mentioned something about the Yankees and um, a little bit of a change in philosophy and how they're evaluating workload in game. And yeah. so it's maybe not the pitch number, but what is the, uh, the ramifications of going extra pitches? Like, fatigue can cause injury fatigue can obviously cause a breakdown in mechanics and missed location and all of that stuff even if you're still throwing 97 miles an hour if you're tired throwing 97 miles an hour you can injure yourself you absolutely can and and i'm sure that that plays into it i think the number was more uh, prevalent for that particular start but when you look at the team that that Luis Hill faced as well against and the success that he had with that fastball is really a promising number, I think, because when you look at the makeup of the Diamondbacks, the Diamondbacks are a lot of they're a scrappy team. They they get on base a lot. They they press the base pass a lot and they couldn't hit his fastball like you, you have guys on there that that can make uh, good contact um, and they just they weren't able to they weren't able to get a good read on it. It it looks like uh, free and easy velocity. It's got movement. And, you know, from, from watching the game, the, the splits are what you just mentioned, but it felt like he was throwing that fastball almost every single pitch. Like he's just like, you know what, you can't touch this. So I'm just going to continue to throw it. And the way that his mechanics right now look so good. Uh, and I think that he's cleaned them up and it, he looks more sound than, than when he first um, came up. And he just looks like a, he looks like a more uh, proportioned athlete. I don't know if you, if you, I was watching some of the highlights of him when he, when he came up a couple of years ago before Tommy John, and you could just tell that he's matured, uh, physically matured uh, as a as a player as well. And he just he looks really good. He looks strong. He's got sound mechanics, and I think the sound mechanics are really going to help him uh, with with his control. Obviously, that's a that's a big piece. Finding that that release point to consistently um, hit that same point over and over again from different pitches. But if he can rely on that fastball and he can pepper the zone with that fastball, and then you know on a on a given day he has that that slider or maybe he's off a little bit if he can rely on that fastball and feel confident that he can throw that thing on a on a dot he's going to have a lot of success and i said this before like he, this is definitely the guy that reminds me absolutely the most about of luis severino when when he came up that electric fastball some off speed stuff um you know he doesn't have the the exact same demeanor as as a severino but my god that fastball looks very very good and you know with confidence that kid's just going to continue to get better so let's hope that the, con- the confidence can continue and he can stay around the strike zone because that's 1000 percent his achilles heel mm-hmm. yep uh so his next start will be against the blue jays i believe on sunday and the blue jays have had a weird season so far because it's like they either score nine runs or they get shut out or no hit like <laughs> the astros no hit them the, the on monday which was right after the yankees got uh yankees swept them so <laughs> it's kind of funny it's like oh the yankees pissed off the astros here they come with the no hitter but the Blue Jays uh, got no hit, and then they got shut out again on Wednesday. And I think there's been two other games where they their, their other two losses, they scored like one run in each or one or two runs in each of the losses. So they, they seem to be like an all or nothing offense right now. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, but how up, up and down, up you know, they've got hitters. relatively good fastball hitting team as well. Yep. So I think it'll be a really good test for 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 heel and and being at home like i'm i'm very excited for that start it's gonna be a lot of fun to watch i'm very much looking forward to this weekend because i I, obviously opening weekend is always fun but if the yankees went you know two and two and four on this or two and five on this road trip it's like okay great we're happy you're home and happy to see soto but like uh, you guys like shitty road trip but the fact that they swept houston and, and were able to take two out of three just add some extra juice to it 
Whether you are a world-class athlete or a podcaster like us, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. The Yankees are no strangers to injuries. They've got some guys out on the IL right now and trying to come back, and hopefully they can do so very soon, looking at you, Garrett Cole and DJ LeMahieu. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of the Bronx Pinstripe Show. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE system. If you haven't heard of the EE system yet, then you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Whether you're here in the New York City area or around the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. If you want to try EE system for yourself, go to unifiedhealing.com slash Bronx to learn more and find a center near you. That is spelled U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash Bronx. B-R-O-N-X. No material or testimonial on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including EE system. Okay. So a couple of other notes that I wanted to touch on. We joked about the Jake Cousins acquisition, um, and he is indeed Kirk Cousins' cousin. I literally thought that was an April Fool's headline when I saw it, but uh, he is. Uh, they got him from the White Sox for cash, and then at the same time, the Yankees DFA'd Nick Ramirez and ended up sending him to the Dodgers for cash. Cousins had, UCL, had a UCL injury in June of 2022, but did not get surgery. He is a, a ground ball pitcher, even though... You wouldn't Gino, know Gino from Gino how he shot. pitched the other day, uh, but he's got a 50.4% career ground ball rate, which is obviously very good. Um, and uh, so there's a couple of uh, roster moves. I expect the Yankees to do some bullpen shuffling uh, quite they've often. They've already done it. It's funny because the beginning of the season here, they've acquired, you know, uh, uh, three guys to uh, one of them. You know, not not uh, not going to be ready until probably mid season um, or so just coming back from from injury. But there you could tell like when you again staring at that bullpen man you look at the names there's there's a lot of un, un, unknowns and uncertainties in there so i think they're just trying to load up with as many of those types of guys uh to increase their percentage of chances of hitting you know some of their because these guys are all brought on this is these are all analytics acquisitions every one of them are analytics acquisitions they see something in the way that they threw in uh, a particular stat that they believe works well with their type of the way that they they want um, their their bullpen to work or a, a you know a, a, a small tweak that that they have made in the past on a particular number to find success like that that is what this is these guys are this is this is this is absolutely analytics driving bullpen names that are coming in and seeing what sticks but you know what if there's one area where i'm fine with analytics doing that it's the bullpen sure i know but it's just that is what's happening. That is 100 Also being opportunist, happening. opportunistic with teams who are trying to shed 40 men roster spots. Yes. Well, I think that's where you can find a lot of this. Like that's, you know, in the past Cashman's tried to find everybody in that, in that, in that way, but it's, it's really has worked with the bullpen. I mean, you have some position player uh, successes that you can go back to and look at it's mostly for short samples, shorter sample sizes, but, um, Rotation, uh, not rotation, but bullpen guys, you can definitely find those those types of guys. Uh, and I think adjustments based on what your system is and and the fact that you're you're making some consistent adjustments and guys are are, you know, like the cutter is a is a big piece of what the Yankees do in the bullpen. It seems like everybody who comes over, whether they have a cutter or not, is developing some some type of cutter or some type of uh, uh, you know, two seam fastball in a, in a way, whether it's whether it's a sinker or a cutter. And they're looking for guys that can execute those, those types of pitches. And, and, and they're looking for certain percentages of ground balls, I think. So there's, they have, they have a baseline of what they did in there. Yes, there is a track record of, of being able to turn around some of these guys. I think uh bullpen is definitely going to be like an ongoing theme with this team this year and the bullpen workload and how they met and who they find to fill those innings in the bullpen, especially if until Cole comes back. And also let's, understand that when Cole comes back, he's not going to immediately be the seven plus inning pitcher because they're not going to push him to do that. 
right? Well, it, so, it depends. Yeah, his his ramp up's going to be. They're going to take their sweet ass time with his ramp up. But for they're sure. also they going to be sixty days. They're also going to be a, probably more conservative with him, where they're not going to push him. Where last season we saw him routinely get pushed past a hundred pitches mm-hmm. deep into the game. It would surprise me, at least for the first month that he's back in the majors, even though he's going to do a rehab. That's not. I, I would be surprised if that happens. So yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. I think that the rotation is relatively con- conservative, but that doesn't mean he still can't get into, you know, get to a hundred pitches. It's still not, it still doesn't mean he's not going to be their best pitcher, obviously. Right. But the first, but, but let's call it the first half of this season is going to be a lot of how are they manage managing pitcher and bullpen workload? Yeah. Yeah. And if, if they the... can acquire somebody, not, I'm not talking about scrap heap guys off 40 man rosters, but do they go out and acquire somebody mid-season that can add to the bullpen like and be slot in to be one of your top three guys in that bullpen. one thousand percent the bullpen is going to be the the area that they're looking to uh make an acquisition uh, that and the rotation most likely depending on what happens here with health and and performance from the guys that are currently there i think Luis heel is a major x factor here because if he's pitching well and uh cole comes back then you have a decision on what you're going to do with him Specifically, depending on what else is going on in the in the uh, in the rotation, he's probably got an innings limit this year. But he, they say he doesn't. They say he does not have an innings limit. That's what have, they're, have, they're was, did I miss that? Did they actually say he doesn't? Yeah, they've, oh, they've talked about him that. not having an innings limit. But you know, again, you you're not going to carry six starters. So if you have him, does he become a why weapon? Why not? In the actually, why not? Point? We've seen teams do six starters recently. They're not going to though. That's going to be a long term because they're just, it's just not going to happen. Why? That's why. You say that, but like, maybe it makes sense this year. I mean, this is again assuming every goal Cole comes back and everyone else is healthy, which probably is not going to happen. Because Cole wouldn't go on a six-day season. rotation. You're gonna so you're gonna find Cole every five days and then figure the figure out the rest of it. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to happen. Why? Because it's I'm not just being not an asshole. To. Like, but like you are we've a little bit te- being not, an asshole. But we've seen teams do this, and if this team is worried about pitching depth and making sure that guys can go deeper into games, an extra day might be able to do that. You can work it so heel starts every eighth day or every ninth day, and maybe gets a two inning bullpen thing in the, in the middle of that. No, I do not want that to happen. Okay. I do not want you to go in and and start, you know, fucking around with Luis Heel in the way that he is, a la. Uh, Phil Hughes, Jabba Chamberlain, all the guys that we have seen in the past that have come up and just been like, that's are you not what they did. Not? That's are not what they did. Are you not? Are you a no. starter? Or are you not? So at some point they're going to have to either stretch it, keep him stretch out or, or not there, there may be another decision to be made too, depending on who is performing well in that bullpen. I'm sorry. In the rotation, Luis Hill, as per my bold prediction, you know, I think he, he stays in the rotation because that's where his impact is. His impact to me, highest impact is in that rotation every fifth day, taking the ball and and hopefully, you know, putting up good numbers. We will remember, see if that works. Do you remember what the Jabba rules were? I don't exactly. It was just pitch count. That's all yeah, it was. I was, was. going to say innings limit, but it was pitch count. We right? look like we, at the time, it, it, because it didn't work out and Chamberlain was struggling as a starter. And we were like, this guy was the most dominant relief pitcher in baseball last year. Like what, why are you doing this? Just put him back in the bullpen. But it's like, no, we want him to be a starter, but all it was, was strict pitch count. That's all it was, which in today's game does not seem weird at all. But back in what year was that? 2008 when they were doing this, all it was, was he's throwing 70 pitches today. He's throwing 81 pitch or 85 pitches today, he's throwing 95 pitches today. That's all it was. And everyone just freaked out and had a mental breakdown because Chamberlain sucked and they thought he sucked because they had a pitch count limit on him. It's like, no, he just couldn't pitch as a starter. But that was part of it. That was more the the job of rules were were you know part of what they had did. nothing to do with pitch count. He, go, I remember these starts vividly. But hold on a second. The job rules throw, were, were were just like the 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 label that put people put on how they failed him count, as a baseball yes. player. They they failed him as a baseball player because they didn't give him a a job a consistent job and let him settle into a job. They flipped him back and forth. And that's exactly what they did with Hughes. And that's exactly, you know, what we saw with even again with Hughes. Kennedy. Hughes went to the bullpen in 2009 because he sucked as a starter. I feel like we're all having re- revisionist history about this. No, but jo- you, you don't, you also don't have, when you have a young guy, it's a matter of giving him enough rope to be able to figure out what he is. And at, at times they didn't give that rope. And again, you, you have pitch count, stuff so, like that. But but give me give me a consistent job. 
They went into the and, 2008 and really the, season. The, the big thing with Jabba was that, yes, he dominated in the bullpen. He was dominant. And he dominant. was musty. He was musty, musty TV. Like that place was going crazy when Jabba would come in. And then they took that energy away from him and put him in the rotation. And that was a big piece of, of I think, why the fans also got very frustrated. Because we saw this dominant guy that brought electricity to Yankee Stadium now is, you know, setting up, warming up, doing a normal thing. Like there's no... There's no electricity. There's no energy when he's entering the game. He's just starting starting the game, and it and it it did. It took away from the effect. I'm looking at his baseball reference right now. Do you know he played until 2016, Jabba? Yeah, he floated around for a while. So as a starter in 2008, he made 12 starts, and he had 65 innings pitched uh, to a 2.76 ERA. So he pitched well. He just couldn't pitch a lot of innings because I remember. He did walk a lot of guys, 25 walks um, in those 12 starts. But I remember he would, he, it would be like the second inning and he would have 45 pitches. So he was a starter, but he was essentially an opener. That's all he was because he was a relief pitcher trying to be a starter. Yeah. And everybody and, wanted, everybody wanted Roger Clemens. And with um, Roger Clemens, he, well, he came back in 07 and then they wanted no, him to I mean, come back Jabba in Chamberlain yeah. to be oh, right, Roger yeah. Clemens. Cause he's just a big Husky guy. And then Ian Kennedy was in that rotation to start that year and sucked. And I think he had Phil, the longest. He he had a hell of a career. he had a hell of a career. And then Hughes was in that rotation that, that year, got injured, comes back in 2009, couldn't be a starter, gets put in the bullpen, and was actually a key piece in that bullpen in the playoffs in 2009. Turns out Phil all Hughes. those guys were better bullpen guys at the end of the day. Well, I don't know because then Phil Hughes pitches great in uh, 2010 as a starter gets put in the all-star game and blows the game. And then was never the same after that pitched. Okay. In Minnesota, Garrett Cole was on the broadcast on Tuesday, said everything is going well. And it's Kermit, the frog voice, man. I hope Garrett Cole never becomes a broadcaster because he cannot string sentences together. Well, he's also just very, he, he's just in his own world, man, which I appreciate. He's a, he's a pitcher talking on a microphone. And that's what he is. And that's what he should be. I don't need him to be a broadcaster. I need him to, even he was, when they're like, oh, you take the, the play by play. And he's like, oh, well, <laughs> and he, he said something that was just absolutely not play by play. It was kind of funny. So he's just like any other, any other guy on the, on the microphone, just having a casual conversation. I appreciate yeah. I have grown to like, I have grown to like his personality a lot. You know, when he first came over, um, obviously excited for who he is, but his personality, I was like, eh, I, I have grown to like his personality because I, I know I can, I know what a perfectionist he is at this point, And he doesn't take anything else that seriously. He takes pitching very seriously. And the, the job that he has as a teammate and being like that secondary pitching coach, but the other stuff, he just doesn't take seriously. And I, I, I just appreciate that. Did you know, cause they brought this up on the broadcast too, his sign today, tomorrow, forever, or whatever it was, was at the, in the 2001 world series at Arizona. I didn't, I, I guess I forgot that fact that that's where that sign was taken from. I, I just assumed that was at Yankee stadium. Yeah. There were, a, there were a bunch of those signs in the, in the crowd for this past series. Well, yeah, because, because that was like the big yeah. thing I guess, from Arizona and he brought it obviously to the, to the pre opening press conference, but he said, uh, he's had a lot of good days in a row. Everything's been going nicely coming along pretty smoothly. Um, so it's encouraging. He has not thrown a baseball yet, but he's been testing his arm through plyometrics to make sure that it is healthy and strong enough to throw a baseball. But as far as I know, there's no ETA on when that will happen yet. It's um, really interesting how they're going through the rehab and the way that they are. And obviously they're doing they're they're talk about CSI Bronx, like on this guy's arm and the way that they're, the way that they're bringing it back to life is, is, uh, is truly remarkable in, in the way that they they're doing it. The fact that he's not throwing a ball, he meant, he joked that he threw a ball with his left hand uh, just to throw a ball. But um, yeah, the plyometrics and, and just isolating the individual parts of his arm and his elbow and, and just strengthening them in that way before a ball is even introduced into the situation. It's fascinating. Yeah. And, and he feels other... good about it. He feels good about it, which to me makes me feel good about it. And the other thing just uh, touch on, because we talked about Volpe's th bad throw, but um, we, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention his four hit game on Monday. And so far on the season, he is nine for 22, which is a 409 batting average. And he's getting on base half of the time. Um, and, and he's a machine know, right now. He's he struck out machine. He struck out twice, I believe it was on Tuesday. No one touched Gallon. Like, like sometimes yeah. you're gonna just get shut down by an ace. Like, yeah. that happens. Um, but like up until through Monday's game, 
He had seen 87 pitches on the season and only swung and missed three times. And so that contact at the plate, pitch recognition, swinging at good pitches, like that's the thing. He's been he's been swinging at good pitches, which sometimes we saw him not do last year. Um, we'd see him last year get beat on that up and in fastball routinely last year. Um, and so far, it's just not been the case. And back to Cole talking about, you know, through those couple innings that he had the microphone, he was talking, uh, they asked him about, about Volpe and, and he referred to Volpe as, as a cerebral player in the sense that like the kid works his ass off, is constantly grinding tape, constantly looking to improve. And that was part of the reason why I'm thinking like this guy's going to have that second, that second season of uh, offensive rebound, because he is that type of player. Like you can tell. It's hard not to like the kid, and and when you hear him talk, he's just like he's a sweet kid. He's just a nice kid, and and he grinds. He, he's a baby he, still. Yeah, he really is. Um, but he's a hard worker, and and he's got that he's got that grind mentality where he wants to be, you know, at the best he possibly can. So the fact that he flattened out that swing a bit and and is is uh you know working on that Cam Maven middle of the field approach. By the way, Cam Maven not having a job is an atrocity. Get uh hashtag uh, get cam hired because the guy's good he just knows what he's talking about whether it's simple or not he knows what he's talking about um what happened did he what happened he was tweeting he was tweeting that he would love to be in the uh in a in a booth but just so hasn't, he, he got he, he did one year with the cubs and that was it i think so yeah but he's got some he's got things to say he's a good uh and he he's that type of guy that's been around for a long time i've been on a bunch of teams and just a good clubhouse guy i want to hear him talk did you hear uh because i know cone did the 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 games this week in arizona but uh, when girardi was in the booth over the weekend did you hear him talking about the middle field approach a little bit it's nice it's nice to hear i like i like hearing baseball guys talking about baseball things that makes sense <laughs> and middle of the field approach for the yankees makes a lot of sense it makes a lot of sense given uh given where they are and the and the type of uh the type of team that they have but yeah and volpe you can't possibly have a better start to the season for than, than this guy. So I'm excited for him to, uh, to come back home um, and, and get the, uh, the ovation that he deserves because, you know, clearly he's been working his ass off in the off season and into the spring. Um, and it's, uh, and it's, it's showing itself. So, so who gets the loudest ovation on opening day? Soto is going to get the loudest ovation. Yeah, definitely. There's no doubt. So, I mean, it was it's either new. Soto it's or it's judge new. Volpe will probably be third though. I mean, at that point, how, who, how are you measuring? But it's, there Decibles. will be, there will be a louder, there will be a, cause it's, it's or a, length, length of ovation. Can we it's measure the first by length? homecoming for Juan Soto? It's the first opportunity the Yankee stadium crowd has given. And he had the, big moments because if he, if he was hitting one fifty right now, right? Like he would get an ovation. But if you remember Stanton's first Yankees homestand, he got booed. Okay. He yeah. struck out five times and got booed. Now, I don't think Soto's going to strike out five times, and he had a good road trip for the most part, had some big moments. So, but um, <laughs> Yankees fans can be quick to boo. Also, by the way, keeping keeping an eye on on that one too. Uh, Stanton twenty at bats, eleven strikeouts. Yeah, I mean, looks looks about the same, unfortunately. <clears throat> Skinny Stanton, same swing. <laughs> like it's still the it's still. I'm the looking same for it. Swing. My brother, my brother was visiting this uh, this this weekend, and we were you know watching. It's like where where is the difference? I don't see much of a difference with with what he's doing at the plate. It really doesn't look no. There's no difference at the plate. Like he's obviously he looks away. different. Uh, he's not as although I feel like that picture in spring training was yeah. like an angle or something because in uniform he definitely he looks look a, all that a little thinner, but like not dramatically. Yeah. So we'll see what we'll see what happens there. But that'll be uh, again not something to watch. Dominguez coming back. Looking healthy, you got John Carlos Stanton clogging up a DH spot. If he's still striking out at a fifty percent clip, something's got to give. All right, that's going to wrap up today's show. Thank you so much to Game Time Doer and Unified for sponsoring today's episode. We'll talk to you again after the Toronto series.